So now we're going to see uh, fuzzy and probabilistic clustering. So these are examples of uh, uh, clustering where we don't have a crisp assignment of each element to a cluster, but uh, examples can belong more or less to uh, the each cluster or to different clusters. So we're going to see uh, the idea of fuzzy sets and fuzzy clustering and the fuzzy C-means algorithm. And then we're going to look at the Gaussian mixture model for uh, probabilistic clustering. Uh, the big difference between fuzzy and probabilistic is uh, in fuzzy sets and fuzzy clustering, we use a membership function that is continuous, but uh, is not meant to represent the probability, whereas in probabilistic clustering, we are talking about the probability of belonging to, to a cluster. We're also going to look at uh, using external indexes for evaluating clustering, and this is related to the second assignment. I'm going to also talk a bit about that at the end. Uh, in the second assignment, you're going to use the, these external indexes. So let's start with the notion of a fuzzy set. Uh, a fuzzy set is uh, a set where each element has a continuous uh, membership value, that varies from 0 to 1 and uh, indicates how much the element belongs to that set. So, more formally, a fuzzy set is a set of, of pairs uh, which of the element and the membership function of the element to the set. So, the idea here is that we can capture some uncertainty about whether or not an element belongs to a set. Uh, consider this example, our elements are different temperature values and our sets are things like cold, warm and hot. There are some temperatures where, ca where we can definitely say that it's hot or cold, but then there are some uh, mid values where maybe it's a bit hot but it's also a bit warm or cold or something like that. So with the first we set, we can, we can model this uncertainty and say, for example, that temperatures in this range are partially warm and partially cold, and then here are entirely warm, but then become partially hot and par or only partially warm, and so forth. So this is not a probability of the temperature being warm or cold. The, the temperature is what it is, but it's a, a way to capture the fuzziness of our set, the fuzziness of these concepts of warm, cold, and, and hot. <coughs> so we can capture things like uh, linguistic uncertainty and vagueness, or even uh, epistemic uncertainty, where sometimes we don't know for sure it should belong to, uh, to either class, but we don't know for sure which it belongs to, and we can also capture that kind of uncertainty with fuzzy sets. Uh, so, uh, note that fuzzy membership is not really a probability, even though it's a measure between 0 and 1, and can also be constrained to, uh, to the same kinds of values of a probability, but it's not meant to be interpreted as a probability, rather it's just a measure of vagueness or uncertainty. Now, using this notion, we can define uh, a fuzzy partition, or fuzzy C partition. It's a, a fuzzy partition into C uh, groups, where we have, for each uh, example, a membership uh, value to each of the, these C groups. And the membership value must be between 0 and 1. Furthermore, since this is a, a partition, the sum of the membership values for each example to all the groups must be 1. So let's, uh, uh, this means that the membership of each example through all the groups is divided between the groups and, not ca and cannot add up to more than 1. And this will also happen that the, the, the sum of uh, uh, all the, example, the membership values of the examples in one group cannot add up to more than the number of examples that we have. So this uh, gives us a fuzzy partition. It's analogous to a partition of elements between different sets, only it's fuzzy. We split the membership of each example into uh, a number of different sets. And now we can use fuzzy C-means algorithm, which is similar to K-means, but for fuzzy sets, to organize our examples into these C uh, clusters. So from uh, this set X 
of data. We have n unlabeled data points. We don't know to which cluster they belong. Uh, we, are go we want to have this C times n membership uh, matrix, which tells us for each of the n examples how much it belongs to each of the C groups that we're trying to, to find. And we also want the centroid for the groups, the, the mean point of these clusters. And basically we're trying to minimize this quadratic error function which has the distance between each example and its centroid. But now, this, uh, instead of that indication function that we used that was 1 when the points belong to that cluster or 0 otherwise, this is now a continuous value that is the membership value of that point in that cluster. And this is raised to a power here, typically this is around 2 or something like that, and this is the, the, the fuzzification uh, degree, the degree of fuzzification uh, that we're using, so typically we use around 2 here, and uh, uh, so we want to minimize that squared error function subject to the constraint that the membership value of each point is divided by all the, the clusters and must add up to 1. So this is a constraint because we want a, a, a fuzzy partition of the data. And by controlling here this M value, we control the fuzzification factor, how much, uh, how, how fuzzy our sets are. And uh, uh, basically the algorithm is similar to uh, the, the k-means algorithm. We can compute, we can estimate the membership uh, value of each point to each cluster if we know the centroid of all the clusters. So this is basically analogous to what we do in k-means when we assign each point to the nearest cluster. In this case, we are not crisply assigning a point to a cluster, but computing how much that point belongs to the cluster. And this is a function of uh, 1 over the distance to the centroid for that cluster, divided by the sum of that over all the clusters, and then raised to that uh, 2 uh, over m minus 1, which is the, the fuzzification factor that makes our, our set fuzzier or less fuzzy. So this means that we can, if we know the centroid, if we know the parameters for uh, our clustering, we can estimate the, uh, or uh, compute the membership values for each uh, example in each set. And then if we know the membership values of each example for each set, we can compute the centroid values uh, for the clusters, and this is simply the weighted uh, mean of the, the coordinates of the examples in the centroid, where the weight of each example is its membership value in the, the cluster. Yes. If you have, if it's less fuzzy, then if it was crisp, all these uh, membership values would be either zero or one. If it's fuzzier, then you, you have uh, more uh, intermediate uh, values here, okay? Do they belong to all the uh, Yes, so a fuzzy, in a fuzzy set, the, it may not belong to all groups yeah. because it can have a value of zero there, but, uh, but it can be split in different, in different parts. So basically, we have this, uh, this idea of expectation maximization uh, once again. We can use an initial guess for our parameters to determine the, the initial estimate of the membership values and then use that uh, to update our, uh, uh, the values of our parameters. Okay. So the algorithm is basically the same as k-means, only we are dealing with continuous membership values. So we, we do this uh, uh, alternative, uh, alternating, uh, computing the membership values, then recomputing the centroids and going back and forth until everything converges or until the change is, is too small and then we stop. The result that we have is similar to k-mean. We have uh, the clusters uh, defined in a similar way, but we have this membership, uh, continuous membership value, which depending on how fuzzy uh, we, uh, we make our sets, they may change, they may vary in different ways. Now, we can go from a fuzzy uh, clustering into a crisp clustering, into one in which each element belongs to only one set and, and not the rest. And uh, we can do that in, in 
some different ways. For example, we can assign each example to the cluster where it has the maximum uh, membership value and all the others will be at zero, that one will be one. We can measure the distance to the centroid or something like that. So it's, it's possible to go from a fuzzy clustering to a crisp clustering just by deciding on some way to cut off uh, those membership values and assign uh, the, uh, the example to only one cluster. Yes? Um, do you consider that kind of like a No, not really. It's not, it's not really an absolute cut. So it can be, uh, it, it's something like, I'm going to assign this, uh, this point to the cluster. It has the maximum, uh, the highest uh, membership value too, for example. Um, but it's not really, uh, but you can, uh, you can have some uh, heuristic, for example, if the membership values are too divided, then you ignore that or you throw away that point. You can do lots of, of different things depending on, on the application. Okay? So maybe you can use the, the membership values as a way of estimating the confidence with which you are assigning to, to one point. So, but the... Um, so I guess, I guess the answer would be yes in some cases. It, it depends on what you're... Because to consider the, the, um, uh, the temperature example. That's not really a confidence level. It's just a measure of the vagueness of the notion of hot or cold. So you're not confident that this is hot. You're just somewhere between hot and warm or something like that. On the other hand, if this was something like uh, uh, predicting uh, uh, credit risk, for example, if a person will pay their debts or not. In that case, it could be a confidence level. So this one is high risk, this is more or less moderate, and something like that. So, th so actually, whether or not you interpret this as confidence level depends on what you're trying to model with the, with the fuzzy membership. Okay. So, from uh, uh, fuzzy clustering, we can go on to probabilistic clustering. The the general idea is the same at the basis, where you have continuous uh, values for assigning uh, examples to clusters. However, in probabilistic clustering, you, we are not trying to model some vagueness of concepts or uncertainty. We are really modeling probability. So we uh, assign for each uh, point, we can compute the probability of belonging to different clusters. So let's suppose that we have a probabilistic uh, model of our data, x, and some y uh, variables there that can include the, uh, either the parameters or the hidden variables w which assign each point to a cluster. And we can, get, uh, we can go from the, the joint probability distribution into conditional probability uh, distributions where we can measure, for example, the probability of the observed uh, uh, sample that we have as a function of these parameters, for example, for maximizing likelihood and so on and determining the parameters. The problem here, uh, in, uh, this is similar to what we had in uh, uh, supervised learning. We, we are trying to adjust something by increasing the probability of the data if that is true, so maximizing likelihood. The thing is that part of what we are trying to figure out here we, we don't know and we cannot control. So we can control the parameters, we know the, the coordinates of the, the points, so to speak, but we don't know how they are assigned to, uh, to each uh, cluster. So this is basically the, the problem for clustering. We have a set of observed data, we know where the points are, we have the, the missing data, the latent variables which assign uh, each example to each cluster, and we have these parameters that are not really random, but we don't know them, and we want to fine-tune them by maximizing the likelihood of all the data, both the data that we can observe and the data that we don't know, uh, to figure out which are the, the best parameters. So maximizing the probability of the data, sorry, uh, given the parameters, that is to maximize the likelihood of the parameters. So now let's... Uh, see an example of probabilistic clustering, which is a Gaussian mixture model. Uh, we uh, create a model, uh, that our model is a mixture of, of Gaussian distributions, 
in one dimension is something like this, the, the typical bell shape. We have the, the standard deviation there, uh, the sigma, and that uh, mu is the, the mean point, the, the uh, center of the, the bell curve here. <coughs> we can consider, we can uh, model some distribution of values by adding different uh, Gaussian curves with different weights. So we could add, for example, one third of this one, one half of this one, and so on. As long as everything adds up to one, we can, we can create a, a combination of these different Gaussians. Okay? So this is the idea of a Gaussian mixture model. We have these uh, probability distributions with this shape. We uh, combine them together with one part, one of them, and some other part of the other, and so that everything adds up to one, to the, the full contribution, and we can then adjust those parameters to try to get the best hypothesis for, for that uh, data set. So, uh, usually we're dealing in more than one dimension, so we, can, we need to extend the Gaussian distribution to uh, multiple dimensions, and the, the equation now becomes a bit, a bit stranger, but the idea is the same. This sigma here, uh, now is the, the covariance matrix which uh, measures the variance and covariance between all pairs of, uh, of uh, variables and so it can give the shape, it can determine the shape of the Gaussian curve in this n-dimensional space, two dimensions, three dimensions and so on. Uh, the rest is the same, we have also the, the mean point for, for the, the Gaussian curve and then we have these uh, uh, these normalization factors here so that everything uh, integrates to one and this is the, uh, the shape of the function that we have for each Gaussian distribution. This gives us the probabilities of points being generated in different uh, coordinates of our space. <coughs> and now we're going to take a bunch of these uh, K Gaussian uh, distributions like this, and we're going to mix them together, each one with a different weight, represented here with a pi, but with the constraint that the sum of these weights adds up to one, so that everything, the integral of everything is one, and that is a requirement for, for being the probability, that if we add up the probabilities of the points for the whole space, it must add up to one, it must be somewhere there. So this is our Gaussian mixture model. We have the uh, covariance matrix for each uh, Gaussian, the mean point of each Gaussian, and the weight that Gaussian uh, curve will have in our mixture model, model here. So, what is the problem? We, don't, we have points uh, that can have come from any of these uh, different Gaussians. So, and we don't know from which one of them each of our data points have come. So let's consider these uh, hidden variables, these latent variables, that are for each point uh, k, z variables. We're going to call them z. This is usually what we call the hidden variables. And they can be either 0 or 1, depending on whether the point did not come from that Gaussian distribution or came from that Gaussian distribution. One constraint is that only one of these variables can be 1, because the point can only come from one of the, of the Gaussians and so the other must be zero, the, the sum of these z uh, variables must be zero. <coughs> and now we can consider that there is a probability of the point having come from each of the Gaussians. So basically we are considering the probabilities of any of those z's being one. It, this means that the point came from that Gaussian curve. <coughs> so basically the joint probability distribution of the data that we can see the x and the data that we cannot see, the, the z, can also be written as the marginal probability of the z multiplied by the conditional probability of the x, assuming uh, some z value. So why is this useful? Because the marginal probability of, of z, that means the probability of a point coming from one specific Gaussian uh, distribution, integrated over all the possible, possibi uh, possible positions of any point, must be exactly the weight of that Gaussian distribution in the, the, the mixture model. Because the, the larger the weight of that distribution there, the, the larger the probability a priori of a point having come from there, even if we don't know where the point is. 
So this is related to that parameter, and the conditional probability of a point and a, at a given position, assuming that it belongs to that Gaussian uh, curve, that Gaussian distribution, can be given by the Gaussian distribution itself, so by the parameters of the Gaussian distribution that tells us how probable it is to generate a point in, the, in each position in space. <coughs> so this representation relates the joint distribution of the variables we know and the ones we don't know to uh, our parameters uh, in a way so that we can now start computing these things. Okay? Uh, so the problem now is that we don't know explicitly these, uh, the values of these latent variables, the z's. But we can try to figure out uh, the, or estimate the probabilities of uh, each point being assigned to each Gaussian or the, the value for that z hidden variable if we know the parameters because the probability of a z being one uh, one of these z's uh, that is the point belonging to cluster k given uh, the point will be the prior probability of belonging to that cluster so the marginal probability of z k being one uh, multiplied by the probability of the point being in that position if it came from that Gaussian curve and then divided by the marginal probability of, of uh, all the points coming from all the, uh, the, the different Gaussian curves. So this we can write as a function of our parameters. This one, the probability of the point belonging to that cluster a priori, even before knowing where the point is, is simply the fraction of the, the contribution of that Gaussian curve in our mixture model. The probability of X ge being generated from that Gaussian, if we assume it came from that Gaussian, is uh, the given by the, that Gaussian distribution using those parameters. And this uh, uh, sum here can also be done if we consider the probabilities over all the different Gaussians in our Gaussian model. Okay, so if we know the parameters, we can get an estimation for the distribution of probabilities of these hidden variables, and so we can write our uh, uh, likelihood function, because now we know uh, we can get the, the probability of the point being generated in that position by uh, this Gaussian, and also we know which uh, Gaussian the point belongs to with which probability because we estimated the probability from that. So this is uh, uh, what we can do with the uh, expectation maximization algorithm. So at the maximum of the likelihood function we can solve that for the derivative uh, equals to zero and we can compute the central point for each Gaussian curve as the weighted average of all the points that, uh, uh, that we have multiplied by the probability of belonging, of having come from that uh, Gaussian distribution. So we use the probability as, as the different weights and we get the weighted average for the points and that's the center, the center of our distribution. This NK is the effective number of points which is simply the sum of the probabilities of the points belonging to that uh, Gaussian distribution. We can do the same for the, uh, the covariance matrix here. Basically, we are computing the covariance matrix by, by uh, measuring the, distance, the, the difference vector between each point and the center of this distribution, and then doing the cross products here to, to get the matrix. But we are also weighting each point, weighing each point according to the probability of belonging to that distribution. <coughs> And uh, the uh, value of pi, the, uh, how much each distribution weighs on the, the final, uh, the, the final uh, combination, so the final weighted sum of all the distributions, is simply the effective number of points it has. So this is the sum of all the probabilities of all the points belonging to that uh, distribution divided by the total number of points. So if one gets half the probability, it will count for half in the final mixture, and so on. So basically, if we have the z values, we can compute this at the point where our likelihood function is maximum. And if we have these parameters, we can estimate the z values. So this is basically, uh, uh, this is actually formally the expectation maximization algorithm. 
The other examples we saw so far with k-means, with, uh, with uh, quasi t-means and so on, were the same idea, it's basically the same idea, but formally it was not expectation maximization because we were not dealing with probability. In this case, this is the actual uh, uh, approach uh, more formally. So we're going to do this uh, in these two stages. First, the expectation stage, where we compute or the, the expected probability for the, the uh, points having come from each of the different Gaussians, assuming a set of parameters, an initial set of parameters, and now we can use that to create the likelihood function, and we know that when the function is at maximum, we have these values for the parameters. So we can recompute the parameters and then go back and redo the estimation and the maximization step. So this is the expectation uh, step and the maximization step when we do this altern in, uh, altern alternating. So let's see an example with uh, these data sets. We have the coordinates for the points, but we don't know which cluster they belong to. And we start with a random set of parameters for two Gaussian distributions, and we do once this expectation maximization. So from the initial random values, we uh, compute the, the probability of belonging to the different uh, clusters, and then we use that to optimize the position of the, the Gaussians that we have here and their contribution to the, uh, the uh, mixture. And then now we can repeat. We can use these parameters to recompute the, the expected probabilities of coming from the different uh, Gaussians and recompute the Gaussians and go on uh, until this converges. So you can see that with two Gaussian components, this, it's not very good to uh, cluster this data set, but we can do this with three, and uh, the, the idea is the same. This is the three Gaussian components after one pass, two passes, three passes, and so the, now the, the variances are shrinking and they're uh, fitting together, fitting nicely around each of these clouds of points. So you can... Uh, use Gaussian mixture models with this class, GMM in scikit-learn. Uh, you can specify how many components you have in, in your Gaussian mixture, and uh, you can specify the type of the covariance restrictions that you're going to apply. So the, the covariance metric uh, measures the covariance between all the pairs of, uh, of features that you have, and so the Gaussian can be of many different shapes. If you restrict it, for example, to only changing the diagonal, so everything else is zero, then it can only shrink or, or enlarge in, uh, along each of the, the directions. It cannot deal with all the, the, the combinations. So you can, uh, you can have more or fewer parameters here, depending on how you constrain the, the covariance matrix. But usually, we, you can just leave it on the, the default, which is that diagonal, and not worry much about that, unless you want to fine-tune something uh, in your data set. And then you have these attributes, the weights of the different Gaussians, and, and uh, the means and covariance metrics for the different distributions, if you want to. And you have the, the usual fit and transform uh, uh, methods that you can use to classify your, to cluster your points into the different clusters. Okay, so this was uh, for clustering, different approaches, the different types of clusters. Now I'm going to talk about uh, using external <coughs> indices to uh, uh, evaluate clusters, specifically when we are comparing different clustering or different uh, uh, labels uh, for grouping points together. So this is the, the RAND index, and the idea here is to draw a parallel between uh, classification and clustering. The thing is that when you're doing classification, you, have, uh, you are predicting one class, class 1 or class 0, and then you have the corresponding class on your data. So you can tell that the true positive is one where you predicted class 1, and it belongs to class 1. Uh, true negative, you predicted class 0, and it belongs to class 0, and so on. However, when we if, if extend this to clustering, the labels themselves are not relevant. So you can do one clustering of the points, and these points belong to cluster 1, and these others to cluster 2, and in another clustering they can put it the other way around. For example, the first point belongs to cluster 2, and the second to cluster 1, but it's still the same clustering, because there is no fixed label 
for the cluster. So in the RAND index we do uh, uh, an analogous uh, measurement of what we did when we were looking at the confusion matrix in supervised learning, but we need to disregard the exact labels. We cannot demand that the labels be the same, even though the clustering may be the same, the numbers of the clusters may be uh, switched. So what we consider is pairs of points. We are going to consider all pairs of different points. So we have n times n minus 1 divided by 2 numbers of pairs to consider. And we consider a true positive to be a pair which is in from the same group in our, uh, in our uh, target label, so the, the external index that we're looking at, uh, but is also placed in the same cluster in our clustering. So if two, two points belong to the same group and we place them in the same cluster, this is a pair that counts as a true positive. If they are from different groups uh, and we place them in different clusters, then this is a true negative. We did not place them together and they did not belong together in the external labeling. Now, for a false positive, is one pair that belongs to different groups in our external uh, label but we place them in the same cluster. So we are falsely saying that they belong together when they should not be together. And uh, conversely, a false negative is a pair that belongs to the same group in the external label, but we place them apart in different clusters. So we are, we are saying that they do not belong together, but they should belong together. Okay, so basically this is an extension or an adaptation of the idea of the confusion matrix, but since we cannot consider the absolute values of the labels that, that can change between uh, clustering algorithms or whatever, we need to consider the pairs of points and, and we are just considering whether or not we are placing the correct points together in the same cluster or we are separating the, one, the pairs that should be separated. <coughs> so using this analo analogy you can compute the, the true positives and true negatives, false positives, false negatives. So basically if we put in the same cluster points that belong in the same group they are true positive. If we put in the same cluster points that are in different groups, they are false positives, and so on. And so, if we measure it like that, we can get the analogous of precision, recall, and accuracy. It's the same, uh, the same thing as we saw with supervised learning. The thing is that, for in this case, we, uh, accuracy is called the RAND index. So this this uh, indicator is the equivalent of accuracy, but when we are considering the pairs of points and not where each point will fall uh, uh, in, uh, by the, the absolute value of the label. <coughs> so you can compute all these indexes if you have uh, for your clustering, for the, the clusters you, you produce, if you also have some labels that tell you which points go together in the same group. And this is part of what you're going to do in the second assignment. So some of you have already started this, but the, the idea is that you have a set of uh, coordinates for seismic events in the last 100 years or so, and uh, you also have um, uh, data labeling, uh, assigning each seismic event to a tectonic fault, so to a fault line between tectonic plates. So each fault line is, is uh, identified with a number, you have a, a column there in your data set, and uh, you can label your, uh, your seismic event according to the fault line they belong to, or in some cases you have some uh, that uh, do not belong to any significant fault line, so they are, they are labeled, they have a, a minus one there. <coughs> So this is an example. Here are uh, seismic events assigned to uh, fault lines. These are those that, are, that don't have a large number of seismic events around them, so these fault lines are not considered relevant and are unlabeled. So what you need to do is to read the data, and then since you need to measure distances between the seismic events, uh, you cannot leave this in latitude and longitude because you see that different longitude values near the pole correspond to much shorter distances and then if you, if you go to minus 180 it's uh, close to plus 180 so measuring distances in longitude and latitude would be, would be pretty hard. So what the first step 
is to uh, convert everything into 3D coordinates at the surface of the, the sphere. So you have the formula for that, and you convert the latitude and longitude to x, y, and z. To read the data, you have a CSV file with column headers and, uh, and lots of different data there that you don't need. So the idea here was to give you something that is a bit more realistic and not just a file that was pre-digested and only has what you need. And uh, one easy way of doing this is reading it with the uh, pandas. You have the read, read underscore CSV function that just reads everything to a data frame and in a data frame you can access each column by the name of the column. So it's easy to extract the data that you need, which is basically the latitude, the longitude, and the labels for the, the fault lines. That's all that you need from, from this file. So then you convert latitude and longitude to the x, y, z coordinates, so the, the coordinates in 3D space. And now you're going to use three different clustering algorithms, k-mean, db-scan, and Gaussian mixture model. So these are all implemented. You don't need to implement anything on your own. You're going to use several uh, indicators to try to evaluate uh, your clustering algorithms and fine-tune the parameters. So use the CDS score as an internal index and then compute these external indexes comparing to the, the fault line labels. Uh, so compute run, precision, recall, F1, and uh, the adjusted uh, run. You have the adjusted run uh, index in the uh, implemented in scikit-learn, so you can... Yes. No, you don't need to change the features because features are just the coordinates you get from latitude and longitude, okay? So you only have, uh, in essence, you only have two features. This is a two-dimensional uh, distribution. The thing is that it spreads in, at, in the surface of a sphere, so you're going to put it in, in three coordinates in 3D, but there's not much point in throwing away one of the features or things like that. Uh, so then, you're going to explore the parameters. For example, the number of the main parameters, you don't need to change everything because then it will be a lot of combinations. Leave everything else in default. Uh, use the number of components in Gaussian mixture models, the epsilon for db scan, and the k for the, the k mean. And uh, you're going to implement also uh, the selection method for the epsilon in db scan that is described in the paper. So this is part of the exercise. You're going to read the db scan paper and implement what they describe there to select epsilon. Uh, and uh, then the, imp the most important part here is the report. So the basic goal of this assignment is to do something uh, that is quite different from the first assignment, but is more realistic. If you're going to use machine learning in, in real applications, you're not going to have someone tell you exactly what to do and, and all the steps to take to, to get your results. So you'll have to think about the data and the different algorithms and understand them. So this is what we're trying to uh, uh, mod, uh, emulate here, in which uh, we're going to pretend that the seismologist that just gave you the data and they don't know what to do with it and you're going to try to explain different ways of clustering, what are the advantages or disadvantages, what works for what, for what purpose, and this is basically what you're going to do in the report. So you'll have to describe how the algorithms work, think about what this means for this particular uh, problem of clustering seismic events, and so, if, the, if it's a good algorithm for this, or if it's a good algorithm to extract this kind of information from the data, or represent the data in some particular way, uh, and you're going to take into account the relation between your cluster and uh, the fault line label. You don't need to go into much detail on the seismology part, so I, I presume that everybody knows that earthquakes occur mostly where the tectonic plates uh, have these, these faults, they, they crunch together or they separate. So this is the basic knowledge that you need. You have the, the labels there for the, the fault lines. You, can, you have the, uh, the map and, you, and a function to draw your, your uh, results on, on the map. So you can, this is basically the, the seismology knowledge that you need. You don't need to go deeper than that. What you need to do is to think about how the algorithms fit or do not fit 
with this data and what you could do with the algorithm. So basically, try to think about what you could recommend to the seismologists to do with this data using one of these algorithms, or maybe two, or whatever you, you think about. But uh, uh, a major part in the report is that you demonstrate that you really understand how the algorithms work and what uh, they can do in relation to, to the data, or why they don't work uh, with that kind of data, if, if that happens to be the case. Okay. So here, for there are some uh, some uh, uh, details. For example, for computing uh, rand index, don't do uh, two uh, nested loops because then things become uh, a lot uh, very slow. So when you're trying to compare for each for each uh, uh, example, for each seismic event, uh, you're going to check all those that belong to the same cluster and belong to the same, uh, uh, to the same fault line and so forth. So if you do two loops there, things become very slow. You should use uh, the NumPy arrays and the ability to compare one element to, to the array and get an array of Boolean values to, to speed that up. Also, uh, for loading data, uh, it's best, uh, you can either write your own code, read all the lines and then split them, but it's best to use Pandas to, to accelerate that. And those parts we will help during the, 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 the tutorial. So uh, this is not an implementation assignment, it's not so much about the details, but uh, one reason for implementing all these uh, uh, indexes, the RAND index, precision, recall and so on, is to make sure you really understand how to go from the, the confusion matrix in supervised learning into the, the equivalent here when comparing uh, clusters with external groups. Okay? So that's part you're going to have to implement. Another one that you're going to have to implement is the selection of the epsilon parameter, but this you have the recipe on the paper, and this is another thing that we're trying to emulate into, in this assignment, which is you'll eventually have to go beyond what you learn here, so you're going to have to to look at the literature, look at the pap at papers or, or other books and something like that. So you need to be able to understand what's there and how to, to implement it and to use it. Okay? So this is another part of the exercise here. So to sum up today, we saw uh, fuzzy and probabilistic clustering. Note that fuzzy clustering is not the same as probabilistic clustering, even though we also have that uh, zero to one membership value, but we're trying to capture different things, not probabilities, and uh, in some cases we don't need to follow the same rules for, uh, for the total membership values and so on. Uh, we now revisited the expectation maximization algorithm. We saw this several times in different clustering algorithms, but in this case this is actually formally the expectation maximization algorithm when we're dealing with probabilities. The other previous examples gave us the same general idea, but was not uh, uh, formally the same thing. Uh, and we talked about the using external uh, labels for uh, measuring how our, uh, the, the performance of our clustering results, and also a bit of uh, assignment too.